Recording is off. So let me know if the presentation goes away. It might if somebody's asking a question, but then it should come back when they're done asking a question. And I do want you to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, and a couple of these slides are still out of order, but I'm just going to go with it. So first of all, I'm assuming that you've done something with Express and that you get what Express is and you've had some sort of frustration with it. If you haven't used Express at all and you think that it's perfect, or if you haven't used Express at all, that's one thing. If you think that it's perfect, we might need to do some brain surgery. But in essence, what I am uh, advocating is a style of coding that can lead to things looking this clean. And I would consider this to be quite clean. So this is hypothetical, but hopefully it's similar to something that you've used before. So profile model is, uh, so, well, let me just start at the top here. So we've got app, which is actually an express router. So there's an express server, an express router, and the express server has an express router. And that's what in most examples you see called app, but that's a little bit kind of confusing because what you really care about most of the time is the router, not the server. Maybe I'll go into that later, but it's enough to say that app here is meant to strictly represent the router, which is the thing that you call .get, .post, .patch, .delete, that, and .use. That's what app is, is meant to represent here. So it's meant to represent a router. And then we have a route and this might be a sub route because there might be like a slash API and then this is being sub routed to slash profile or whatever, it doesn't much matter. And then we have our profile model is gonna be our database. It doesn't matter if it's Mongo or SQL or whatever it is, this is just hypothetical to show. This is what a database often looks like. And sometimes a database dot get, if there's zero rows, it just returns null and sometimes it throws an error so you might need to be able to catch an error from the database and say if the error is uh, no records found or eno record or something like that you might want to say well that's not really an error so if um it, because we can we can create a new record you know so the first time you access a person's profile uh, if they haven't created a profile with their name and their bio or whatever yet, that's fine. You can just create one at that at that moment. And so that's what this is kind of demonstrating is the idea that you can get something and if there's a real error with it, you'd want to throw that error. But if it's just the, this doesn't exist yet error, you might want to create it. And if I'd done this a little better, I might do the rec.user ID in here to simulate that we're going to create a profile that's attached to this user's ID. And then out of all of that, what you want to get is some sort of result. And then you're going to do some stuff. Whatever that stuff is, we don't really know. But you're going to do some stuff. And normally in Express, you would do res.json with whatever your end result is. Uh, and I'm not necessarily advocating that this is better. In fact, it might be less clear uh, to the reader. But I, I'm, I'm kind of liking it. The idea that you can, if you don't need to set headers and you don't need to dig into the object, you don't need to pipe a stream. If all you need to do is just say, hey, send this JSON back to the user. I kind of like the idea that you could return the JSON and then when you need to do the setting headers and all that, then you use the res object. So anyway, this is the ideal. This is what we're, we're I'm proposing is this is the best possible way that you could write code that does this code. And what hey, I want to ask, what's that? Are you sharing anything right now? Oh, I'm. Uh, do you not see it? I don't. Uh, does it? Does anybody else see what I'm sharing? I can see you. Yes. Uh, let me. Let me see. Do I, need, I might need to pin my screen so that it forces everybody to see it. I'm not really clear on how that is done. 
I'm trying to flip through right now and it's just not giving me the options that I'm expecting. Uh, let's see. Um, speaker stats, settings, participants, tile view. Hmm. Uh, so I would I would say just click around a little bit in the Jitsi window and you should see an icon for me. And if you click on that, then hopefully you, you can see me. But since other people can see me, I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. All right. So this is the alternative. Uh, or, or not the alternative, but the alternative. But this is what most Express code looks like today. And this is the exact same code. Is on. All right. So again, this very clean, simple, easy to read. This is actually what most Express code that exists looks like. And so I want to go through this and kind of explain it. So now newer Express code, what people are learning in boot camps today, they're going to be learning to use um, probably async await, which is actually not quite as bad as this, but then worse. That, well, we'll go into it. I'm going to show the same example over and over again, and we're going to build back to the original. So here, this is without using promises, without using async await. This is just using the old callback style. So you've got your model, you're going to do a get, you're going to pass a function into it, it's going to receive an error or uh, possibly an error or null, and then a row from the database. And this bit right here, I'm defining up front, I could define this down at the bottom, it doesn't matter really where the point is just that then I have to have some sort of function that if everything if I handle all the errors, and everything goes well, at the end of the day, I need to be able to hand stuff back to the user. And that's what this respond function is representing. So we'll get back to that in a second. So that's not going to execute yet. That's just being declared there. So what's going to execute as soon as we get our callback is we're going to check to see if there's an error. And then if the error is the bogus error that there's just no record, um, then we're, we don't need to worry about it. But if it is not that error, if it's any other error, then we might have some sort of error handling function. And so we'll say, okay, handle errors with this error and then return. And actually that probably should have a res in it as well. So forgive the hypothetical here. Um, and then, then if, it, if there was an error or not a user, I may have actually written this wrong. I'm sorry, it's long and confusing. Yeah, catch function error. Okay, yeah, then no. So, so let's say that the error was e no record, then we're going to create the user. But then when we pass the create, we also have to catch the error and then the row that it creates. And so then we're going to have to handle the error the same way that we did here and the same way that we did here. So we've got this little bit of code repeated where we've got these handle error return, error, handle error return, because we need to make sure if we don't return, then what we could accidentally do is we might actually respond on the next line with a res.json because we forgot to put our return before the error is actually doing whatever it's supposed to do in the handle errors function, which might also be asynchronous or whatnot. So we always have to do the return and then then we're going to do our stuff. You know, So we got to the point where we actually have the row that we wanted and now we go do our stuff, whatever that is. And then we need a callback for when this stuff is done that we're going to respond. So that's one code route. And then the other code route is if we didn't get an error, we actually got the row right away, then we can call do stuff and respond. So previously there was only one end condition, which was do stuff. And now we have two places where we can have our end condition. And we have three different places where we have to handle errors. Whereas before we only had actually zero places where we handled errors. And I'll get to why that is in a little bit but up to this point any questions so what if someone were to say well why don't i just use the then would you respond you're so going to hear that as pushback 
No, well, that's not, that's non sequitur to this discussion. So this is, would using promises be an improvement upon this? Absolutely. In fact, you can see this uses promises. So it's not, I'm saying this is what most code looks like. If you go into an existing project that has been around for a couple of years, this is what the code looks like, right? I mean, like argue with me if you are at work and you're dealing with Express and you've never seen code that looks like this, argue with me. It usually goes out. Quite a bit further. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. It goes so off the page. Well, as you can see, I can't. I can't fit it on the slide. That yeah. Way. Yeah. Okay. But so I agree that it usually gets very nested and wiry. Yeah. As you go. So here's here's the next bit. It's actually worse than this, as you say, and here's one of the reasons why. So we're going to simplify this to say that the only case that we handle is we're going to get something from our user model and there's a possible error there and we're not gonna create something else. So most of the error handling code that I've seen and what I used to do myself, I mean, I've made every mistake that I'm gonna talk about or every you know ANSI pattern that we're talking about here is something I've gone through because I you know went through Node since 2010. So I've, I've been through it all. But um, you, what you'll see is people actually do their error handling without having an error handling function, but just every time there's an error, they do you know five or 10 lines of stuff. And this is this is the worst possible thing you could be doing is you know this, but even worse, because then you're doing you know, five or 10 lines of error, error handling code. So the, the first step to making Express better is very, uh, not well known Express has error handlers. So you don't need, you, you really don't need to have custom error handler functions. So you don't need to have a, a handle errors function in your route most of the time. There might be something that's super custom, super specific, like you're using a library and it gives you back a particular type of error and you really need to, to handle that error right there and there's nowhere else you'd, where you'd ever need to handle that error. Maybe, maybe, it would be a good idea to handle it there. It might still be a bad idea. Depends on you know how it ends up being readable for the team. But what you definitely don't want to do is be handling your errors in, in line. Instead, you have an error handler. And the error handler, you can actually scope this to whatever you want to scope it to. So this right here, this would be a default error handler because uh, I don't know if you can see down at the bottom, but it's app.u slash handle errors. And the difference between an error handler and middleware is that an error handler has four uh, objects that it receives. And an error handler must come last. Error handlers, middleware are executed before your route handlers are executed. Error handlers are after the middleware and the routes. But you can, you can have multiple. So you could have one that matches slash profile and just error, handle all your errors in there. So if you had you know, five different ways that you might want to handle errors, but you want the, you want the happy path to be really readable. It's, it's, if you have to shift the complexity from one side of the board to the other, optimize for the happy path because we don't, we, we want to understand you know, like you were talking about earlier, what we want to be able to read and understand is what is the objective or the goal of this code and is it completing it? And so if we can move that error handling code, which hopefully is just stuff like, um, going back to the user, is this an error message I can show to the user with a 400 style error message or is this an error that I want to hide from the user behind a 500 internal server? So that's kind of the, the, the scope of what this is. You might have a switch statement or something, um, but the idea is you don't have any error handling code in your express routes and you don't have to pass rec or res or anything because you're gonna get rec and res here. So you can just say next error. And this is how express has been for years and years. It's just one of those little known secrets. Um, it's really easy to use, really handy, and you can have 
like I said, multiple air handlers. If you need to have one for, you know, we're talking about doing uh, OAuth. If you've got a part of your application that's slash API slash OAuth, you can have an air handler for slash API slash OAuth. And then you could have another error handler that's the general error handler. The important thing is just that the error handler comes after whatever routes you're defining. So there we get significant cleanup, not that the code is any shorter, because in fact, it's the same number of lines of code, but we just have a better separation of understanding, okay, kind of here's the happy path. If everything goes well, this is what we do. And then this is where we handle the things that don't go well. Um, now, if we add promises, which is what you were talking about earlier, so then we get some dot thens and some dot catches, we can clean this up a lot. So let's go back a couple of slides. So this is what it looks like with just callbacks, or they're called thunks. Node style callbacks are called thunks. That's when the error is the first uh, value to be received in the function. That's called a thunk. So if we do the promises, this gets us a lot better. And one, one thing that I don't think people take good advantage of is dot catch. And just error handling in general, it's, it's, it's difficult. But we do, we do want to use dot catch and it actually gives us a really great affordance, which is that now if I wanna do the thing that I was doing before where I'm gonna create a new profile object, I can do that uh, you know, I can either rethrow the error that is not an error that I can handle immediately, or I can handle the no record error by creating a new record for the thing that I need. So after that, then I have a dot then that handles the happy path, meaning that either I got my profile on the first try or I didn't rethrow the error. I caught the error and then I created a new profile. So there's my happy path. I only call do stuff once, just in that one place. Um, then I've got my dot then and my res.json. And then at the very end, I have a dot catch next. And so this means that promises can be a little tricky because you have to control the flow of execution and it's difficult to say, okay, well, I can handle this error, but I can't handle this error but I don't want the flow to continue. I don't know if I can actually describe this well. I know I have this problem frequently, but it's difficult to describe it. Maybe if you identify with it, you'll get what I'm saying or you can clarify for me. But you get these problems where if you catch the error, then it'll continue down the, the flow, but you, you, you want it, you, you don't want it to actually continue, you want it to stop. You want it to like catch the error. You don't want it to throw a big exception. You don't want the thing to blow up, but you just want to be like, if you got to this error, then there's nothing else to do. You don't need to explode. You don't need to throw an exception, but I don't want you to actually continue on to the next thing. Does that make sense? You, you get what I'm talking about? Any questions about that? It was, is that making sense? Is a, the ideal situation which you were explaining, would that be achieved by doing a um, reverse, like within a catch statement, doing a res dot status 500 send your error message? Does that effectively stop the execution of code? I know it's not well, being done here. But that's no, what I'm looking it, at some of my existing code doing. It won't. And I'll I'll get to a solution for it. Apparently my my camera stopped working, so I'll just turn it off there. I'll get to the solution for it. But imagine right here, we instead of doing return profile.create, we said, oh, if there's no record, there's nothing that we can do. We'll just call res.json uh, with it, with nothing, uh, with an empty object, mm -hmm. and we'll call it good because there's nothing there, so we'll just return an empty object. Well, then it would still go down to this dot then. And then it would still try to do stuff. So there's not a way for me to say, catch the error, but don't continue to the dot then. Okay, so so either of those would still have that problem. Yeah, because if you do the res.json, then you would end up with another exception, which would be when you get down here and it tries to do stuff with results, then it would throw and then it would catch. We've already responded, so by the time it catches it, 
it would just do nothing but log it out to the server. So the code would function more or less as intended, probably, but you'd be getting extra errors in this account. So I'll, I want to go on f from that particular question because it will be easier to explain it when I get to the part where I solve it. Um, but any, any other questions before I go on? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna move along then. So now we were, were at promises. Okay, so here's promises. It's kind of meh, it's better. It's better than the really, really bad case, but it's not great. And we can, one solution that you could have here is you could throw a special error even if there's no error, like you could throw an error, not an error, and then at your bottom, at the bottom, when you catch, you could check to see is the is the code of the error e not error, and then you could just ignore it. That's one way that you could handle this. But it it's that feels like an anti pattern. It feels wrong. So let's go the async await rate uh, route. Now I think this is worse because now we've substituted promise chain hell, which actually wasn't that bad in this case, for try catch hell. So whether we're going the route of we're doing callback hell or we're doing chain hell or we're doing try catch hell, it's all hell. It's just, you know, the, are we shifting it to the left? Or are we shifting it to the right? Because people are like, oh, async await's so much better because you don't have to deal with all those promise chains. And I look at your code and I see, well, what do you what do you call this? And the thing that I hate about this is that the errors start to become disassociated. I don't know if it happens quite so much in this example, but the errors really start to become disassociated from where they occur. And so you start seeing like the, you've got a try nested in a try and then somebody catches this error, but then there's the possibility of another error right here, which seems like it should be in the same block of code because it's all about either getting them the profile or handling the error of a profile, but instead it ends up leaking down to here and so then you've got this try catch up here that's throwing an error that's getting caught here and then thrown here. And it's just like, it, it's super confusing. It's, it, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that you've had some experience with this to know that it's bad and I don't have to sell you on the idea that it sucks to deal with this. So okay. do you recommend doing the, uh, the then catch over the try catch? Absolutely, absolutely, because it's cleaner code. But there, you, you can get cleaner still. Oops. So this is, I think this is cleaner because at least here, I know it, it just feels like things are more congruent. Things are happening in an order. I, if there's an error, I'm catching the error here. I'm not catching the error down here. And then if there's no error, it's executing up here. It, it just, the flow to me makes more sense. So but we can get better than, we, we can take a hybrid approach and we can get a lot better. So let's go a little bit further. Um, okay, that might, I think I should have had one more in there before I jump to this, but we'll, cause that's where the slide is, we'll go with it. And I think that there's a slide out of order later, but I'll, I'm just gonna go with the way the, the slides are right now. So here, we've, this is the first slide that I showed. So we can call our get and then we can await it. So we don't have to have a dot then. We can await it, but we can await it and we can do a dot catch. So we don't have to have a try catch. We don't have to, we can handle the error right there, nice and cleanly, and it's not gonna leak down somewhere else. We don't have to nest. We await it and we catch the error. Now, here's the thing. There are errors that you can handle and there are errors that you cannot handle. And it's important to distinguish between the two. If there is no user profile, we can handle that. We can create a blank user profile. If there's a database connection error, we cannot handle that. There's nothing that we can do in our code that's going to fix the fact that somebody tripped over a TCP cable in the data center or an ethernet cable in the data center. Our code can't solve that problem. So when we await something and we throw, it's going to bubble up. 
But by default in Express, that wouldn't work, which is why we have to do this and why so, much, so many people's code looks like this. Because if you were to wait and you were to rethrow an error, well, then the error is going to bubble up. And so you have to wrap the whole thing in a try catch. And this is kind of nasty. But uh, async router is a wrapper that I forked. Somebody else had it working for the general case. And then I patched it so that it would handle errors and they didn't respond to my pull request, so I just published it myself. But this will make it so that, oh, actually that, that should say async there. There's a couple of errors in the slides. But this should say async here. And so what will happen is that the app.get, it is calling the express router app.get, but it actually is wrapping it in, um, async await error handling first. And so if you write the code like this, and I'll show you how you use async router in just a minute. But if you use the code like this, it will call next.error on whatever await bubbles up as the error. So you don't have to have this problem of, well, if I handle the error and I call next.error on it, now the code execution is still going to float. Code execution stops. Error is thrown. Error bubbles all the way up to the top. At the very top, it calls next.error behind the scenes. And then at the very end, it's redundant to put return await because you could just do return without the await. But it's to be illustrative that this is an async await function. So let me skip over to how you would use this and then I'll go through some of this other stuff here. I actually need to go back. Okay, I'm gonna Google search root async router. And if I'm lucky, it'll be the first hit. Well, my blog article is which is good enough because it links to it and it has the code that's in the readme. I think it links to it, should link to it. Oh, links aren't. Well, okay, I need to put the link to the actual module, but this is the same thing that's in the readme essentially. So to use this, to get this functionality, all you have to do is separate your express server from your express router. And you'll hardly see examples that do this, but they're actually two separate things. And so here, this at root async router dot router, it creates a couple of wrapper functions with async await. It's very small. It's less than 100 lines of code in total. I could show you the source later, maybe. And it returns the app, and, it's, and it just wraps over the express code. So this isn't like a hugely custom router. It's just a little bit of wrapper function to handle errors and uh, return values. And so then you get to use it just like you would otherwise. So none of your code that exists breaks. All of your callback functions still work. All of your a try catch async await code still works. Everything still works, but you can then start going in and slowly refactoring your code if you want to. And that's where for me, uh, you know, because if you're creating a brand new thing, people are, you know, people, I posted this on Reddit and uh, zero people that left comments actually watched the video. People that actually watched the video and put a thumbs up on YouTube, but people just immediately had this knee jerk reaction of, well, you shouldn't use Express because you should use Fastify or you should use Koa or you should use XYZ. And maybe you should. There probably is something better for, you know, certain styles of use. But the fact of the matter is when you go into a job, Express is there and you have to work in the environment as it exists. And this gives you a stepping stone. So it the only difference is that when await errors bubble up, they get caught and they go to your error handler. And the way that you use it is you, you still require Express, but you don't do Express to create your app. You create your app with the modified express router or not modified, but wrapped express router. And then you create your express server where you do your use proxy and, or I, oops, that was supposed to be set proxy, not use proxy. But you know, if anything that you need to do with a dot set 
or the other options that go with an express server that are not part of the express router. It's not part of the, the use, get, patch, post, that thing. Those you still do in the same way. And then at the very end, you just put your dot use and then you pass in your router and then that creates a sub router, but the sub router is off of the root. So it functions the same as the default router. So that's it, it's three line change. You're doing this and you're doing this. And then the rest of your code, whatever exists is the same. And then you get the ability to have the error handling function a little bit better. And then you see a lot of people call dot listen directly on the express server, but I don't like that because then you lose your handle to the HTTP server. So I prefer to just call listen on the HTTP server itself. It doesn't really matter unless you're doing web sockets or something else like that that needs access to the server. But I find that if you just have a pattern of doing it this way, then when you go look at an example and it's like, okay, you need to pass your HTTP server into this thing, you're already familiar with doing that. And it's one extra line of code because you have to call create server rather than just calling HTTP handler.listen or app.listen or whatever. So anyway, that's that, but you know, some total you're looking at three to four lines different from what you're already doing. All right, I'm gonna go back to the slides. Well, actually, before I do, questions about this, what makes sense or doesn't make sense about what I'm showing you here. So, if I wanted to use this in an existing app, I can drop in this solution, and assuming that I've added the error handler in the last middleware, last install on the middleware chain, I could, get rid of my unhandled promise rejection points? Yes, well, maybe, it depends. If you're actually returning your promises inside of the express function, yes. If you have so-called dangling promises where you don't actually do anything with the promise, like I see people do this and it confuses me, And but People sometimes put a set timeout around things because they don't want it to throw inside the express execution. If you're doing stuff like that, no, it's not going to solve that problem. It has to bubble up. But if you have either an await in front of the promise or return in front of the promise, then yes. Then it will get rid of those unhandled rejection errors. Any questions on the Jitsi feed? Comments? I'm gonna give you all 30 seconds. Everybody's muted, which is fine if you don't have anything to say, but I'll just let things hang in the air. If you got a question, you can ask it. Okay, that sounds like no questions. So I'm gonna go back here. So, I I want to reiterate with a smaller example here. This is this is what I consider the ideal error. The ideal error handling case would be you have a route with a slash error, you create an error on purpose, you throw that error, and this is handled gracefully. So if you already understood what we just went through, you already get that this would be handled gracefully, but I just wanted to show this is one line. All it does is create an error. This would be handled gracefully. You would not get unhandled rejection promises or unhandled exceptions, assuming that you have, well, even if you don't have an error handler because Express has a default error handler. So even if you don't create your own, the, the downside is that then the user doesn't get an error that uh, you know your application can consume and display pop up. Oh, there was an error, try again. This is what the error was if you need to contact tech support. They would just get that nasty page that's stack trace of errors, which you know you don't want. So you do want a custom error handler in all cases, but this right here would get caught and be handled by your custom error handler and you could res.js on it, whatever. Okay, um, so emulating the, the, the set timeout here is just to, to emulate something that is an asynchronous function. 
So this is the way that you'd have to do it presently. Uh, these two are the same. This is if you have root async router, and this is if you are doing it the way that you should have been doing it in Express already if you had known that Next actually has error handling built in and you had you know already had error handlers. Um, and then this is to demonstrate just there's another tricksy problem that happens here. So we can have an asynchronous function. We do stuff can be asynchronous, but there's maybe 10 lines of code before it does whatever is asynchronous. And in those 10 lines of code, you could have an error. So you actually can't rely on asynchronous errors to happen asynchronously unless they're wrapped in a try catch. The reason being that you might have an error where you didn't expect the error to occur. So you may not have been using a callback to send the error. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm gonna just give a quick example of this because I feel like I can. So if we have a function do stuff and it accepts some options and a callback and I do something like bar x equals one dot oops plus two um, db dot get x callback. The database could have an error inside of do stuff and that would correctly be handled with callback. But we could also have a syntax error before we ever do whatever, not a syntax error, um, but we could have some sort of logical error before any async stuff happens. And so in this case, if I called do stuff, um, actually it probably needed to be something like double oops. Like it's contrived, it's stupid, but just you get the point. I mean, this could be um, say user dot profile dot name. If profile doesn't exist, then we're going to get a cannot get dot name of undefined. And so that would throw. And so instead of going into the callback, you'd, you'd get thrown. So whoever is implementing this would have to wrap this in a try catch and do that there. But you can't guarantee that they've done that. And you probably know from experience that that's not guaranteed to happen. And so you have to put your try catch here. And so then you're pulling the error handling it's not even your error handling. It's you're catching an error that happens somewhere else and do stuff that should have been handled and do stuff, but wasn't. So this, this is, but again, if you're using this pattern, even if you have this type of error, you don't have to do all the try catch stuff because in an async function, whether it's a synchronous error or an asynchronous error, it's going to blow up. So, we wouldn't have to worry about it if we were doing the clean method either way. Right. Okay. Right. Um, you would have to worry about this type of thing where there's a set timeout in the callback function, but um, that's, it, it, you know, it's, there's no, there's no silver bullet that can solve all possible problems that a human can create, but it, yeah, it is your best possible defense. Uh, there is no other solution that is better. And I don't believe there could be a solution that's better just by the constraints of the way the language works. There are only so many possible solutions to generic problems. Anyway, uh, yeah, we talked about custom error handling. That's just, you know, if you want to look at it on just one slide without any of the other stuff, here we are. This is the custom error handling. And then what I typically do for myself is if I'm throwing an error in my own application, what I'll do is I'll do something like this, where I do let error equals new error, and then I'll put here the thing that is visible to a user. So uh, passwords didn't match. So capital first letter, punctuation, this is what I'm expecting that if the user sees this error, this is acceptable. And so what I would do is I do error.status equals 400, which is bad request. 
and that 400 indicates the user did a problem, made it, created a problem. There's not a problem in the application. The application is functioning properly, but the user gave bad inputs. And so this is how I will do errors, is I'll do error.status equals 400, and then I'll do throw error, and I'll also do error.code. So um, I, I usually do E underscore, and then I'll say, um, I'll, I'll try to keep a catalog. Uh, I don't know if this would be a good name, but this, this would be how I construct and throw my error. And then in my error handler, my error handler will just check if error.status less than 500. Well, actually what I do is this. I do, so this is down here, this would be my error handler. I'll do error.status equals error.status or 500. And then I'll do a check if error.status greater than or equal to 500, then I'm gonna just console.log the error or console.error the error. And then I'll put something like unexpected error, server error. And then down here below, if the error.status is not greater than or equal to 500, that means it's an error that I intended to show the user. So then I'll do res.json success false uh, message error.message code error.code. And so here what you get is you're returning a message that it's safe for the user to see. And then when you get to the point where you want to internationalize your front end, then you're passing a code that the front end can either reinterpret your error message and display something different or substitute a different translation. Or you could even do the substitution of the translation inside of the error handler if you needed to do that. But this gives a, a nice clean way to say any database errors, any file system errors, anything that I didn't expect is highly unlikely to have an error.status on it. Uh, there's, you know, somebody somewhere is putting error statuses in their, you know, in their code, but it's just really highly unlikely. So this is a really simple way for me to just, you know, 99 times out of 100, if the, if the status code is below 500, it's because it's something I created myself in my application, and that's good enough for me. Just can you go back to your gist for a second? Yeah. Um, I can't remember. What does if uh, if there's no dot status, it's going to result to undefined. So it's going to say undefined. Well, no, because I'm doing this. I'm doing this here. I should I oh, should yeah. write this a little bit of a better way. If not error dot status, that would that, this would be the more appropriate way to write this. If I was wanting to make it more readable and not be short handy. Gotcha. And I'm actually going to save that because I'll update this later and put that in there. Yeah. So, uh, and then the the ideal database, if we you know did a dot get on it, um, and there was nothing there, it might return null. However, this actually does present a problem with the async router, because if you return a falsy value, and I might need to just bug fix this so that it's only undefined and not false or null, but if you return a falsy value, then this would not work. This would need to be res.json results, which would then return null, because if you did a return null here or re return undefined here, then what that would signal is you did not return a promise, uh, or it appears as though you didn't return a promise because there's no result at the end. And so it would not call res.in for you. And so when you hit this, then you, you'd actually get the spinner and it would just sit there and you'd never get a response back. So that is one caveat that I actually uh, need to mention that. So that's that's an argument for not doing the return style, but just doing the res.json style, I, I'd say. Um, sometimes things are cute doesn't mean that they're a good idea. I'm still flirting with the idea of doing the return as opposed to the explicit res.json, but that is one caveat that's where it doesn't work as you would expect. But also, I'll just do this right now. Um, async router roots GitHub. 
I'm just going to open up an issue. Okay. Let's say return null should call res.json. Right. Define values should not hang on return. Let's put that there. So go back. So I may I may fix that, but still, you still run the risk that it could return undefined. I, I don't think that any proper library should ever return undefined for something that can return a value. If it can return a value, ideally, it should return the empty value of that value or null. So if I've got some sort of math function, if something that returns a number, it should be either returning negative one or zero to mean I didn't return anything. If I've got something that can return an object, it should be able to return null. If I've got something that can return a Boolean, it should return false. The type system should match most of the time is my opinion. So you should not, in, a, in an ideal world, you shouldn't encounter something where results would be undefined. It would either be an, an object or an empty array or a null or something. Um, and I think that's what originally, I think that's what this this example was. I think originally it was something like bookmarks and I changed it to profile later. And so this would have been an empty array. And so it would have worked, would have worked, <laughs> would have worked. Okay. Um, handling empty data. Oh, that's what I just talked about. Uh, so yeah, if you don't get the result, then you want to, you know, make something up to send back if you're going to return it. Um, we already covered that. That's just a slide that's out of order. Yeah, okay. We already covered all that stuff. So, Fiend, that's my presentation tonight. So I'll reserve uh, five minutes for questions and then we can go back to chatter and ideas about things we were discussing earlier. So you mentioned that a lot of companies use Express. Yeah. And, and it sounds like that's more of a contract. It sounds like some developers don't like that. Do you see that changing anytime soon and moving away from that? No. It's not a matter of what works best. Like, so for example, I can only help you know, seven people with this solution, right? You go out armed with this solution, great. This will never become a popular solution because we've got, you know, coming up on 15 years of people doing it this way. So it doesn't matter how much better the alternative solution is. When there's 15 years of people doing it that way, that's going to remain the precedent and the way that things go. Now, if what, what happens typically when things get better is that it's a quantum leap or a monumental shift. So something comes out and replaces node entirely, then we'll move on. But it's kind of like this. Nobody uses PHP except for people that use WordPress. And no one's ever going to replace WordPress. There's never going to be a product that competes with WordPress and overtakes it because WordPress has its niche and the niche is full and there's no room in the niche for anything else. WordPress is what WordPress is and it's, it's in PHP and that's the way that it is. And, and PHP is, you know, all but dead and gone in a lot of ways, but it's, it's, it's going to be WordPress forever and express is, is kind of the same way. Express is not necessarily the best thing that we have, but in the world of Node, Express is always going to be there because it's what was there. And there would have to be something that gains enough popularity and momentum. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how this could change. If the Express authors can't, because we saw this with Request. Request.js only needed one small change, which was to support promises. And instead, what the author did was put a notification, request.js is deprecated. And that actually led to change. The code didn't change, he didn't do anything. He had not made a commit for something like two or three years. The code base had just been stagnant, the same way that Express is. 
The last thing that he did was just said, hey, I've already not done literally anything with this for a couple of years now. I'm letting you know that I'm never going to do anything with it again. And just by tagging it as deprecated, it gave people that emotional sense of tension that the industry shifted. If the current maintainer of Express were to come out tomorrow and put a deprecation notice on Express, the emotional fear that that would cause people would cause them to seek an alternative technical solution. But people will never, I, unless that happens, I can't see another technical solution ever taking the front seat. Um, there's one other case where this happened, which is underscore and Lodash. But the reason that happened is because the guy was so aggressive. He followed the underscore, excuse me, GitHub issues, and he answered every single question that somebody had with a full blog post. And so he was able to, he was so incredibly motivated, he was able to subvert the system and get people to switch over to Lodash. But again, I don't, I don't know that if someone were to go through the Express repository and answer every single question and pro provide a solution for every single issue, maybe they could get it to take over. But it, would, you know, it has to be something monumentous. It's not just like us seven guys in the room say, you know what? Fastify is actually everything that we need from Express, except smaller, more secure, easier to use, more modern. That's not going to change the 15 years of Express being the top dog. It's probably way too much babbling for what you needed to hear, but. That's the first mover. That's what it has. That's a big advantage. Well, it wasn't the first mover because there were others before Express. You think of Express as the first mover because it's the one that stuck. But there were three or four. The one that I used to use was called Connect. And eventually the two projects kind of like merged and diverged. Like Connect became Express, but then Express 4 moved everything back out into modules and then it was pretty much Connect. And then it was like, well, I need to use Connect because Express 4 is basically what Connect was. But yeah, it's, it's got the stickiness. I have a question, but do you have a question? I think I was going to see if this makes sense. It's a long story short, the niche will always be filled with Express, and the only way it would go away is if the niche gets smaller and it, it's a completely different, well, I think you called it quantum. Well, shift rather than a so there has to be a 10x improvement. There is a book called The Innovator's Solution, and it talks about how basically theories of economics and why people behave the way they do in regard to business decisions and products. In order for people to move, something has to be, you know, the elevator pitch has to be when I hear it, I know that this is 10x better. And I don't need I don't need a presentation on it. I don't need to learn it. Like all you need to do is say one or two sentences, and I know this is either going to be ten times cheaper, it's going to be ten times faster, or it's going to be ten times as robust, and that it's not going to have any negative consequence at all. So I'm going to get ten x, and the negative is going to be zero downside. Okay. Right. So I would say there's nothing. This that ten x is a threat right now. Yeah. This, I, I say this is a 10x for me. I think when I show it to people who are familiar with Express and the problems that it has, like it's got some sticking power. But the thing is, most of the people that believe that this is a good solution are going to, that this is only good for projects that exist. This is only good for brownfield code. Because if you're going to create a new project on your own and you've had this presentation tonight, you'd go look at Fastify or one of the other alternatives to Express and you'd say, oh, this one looks like it's the best. It doesn't require that I do this little wrapper around Express. So I'm just going to use Fastify and I'm not going to use Express for my project. So if you had a Greenfield project and you're interested in this. And so it's, you know, again, the niche is very small. It's brownfield projects for people that recognize the problem, understand the solution, but are going to use Express despite the, the fact that something else would have been a better choice. All right.
Well, I had a question on one of your slides. You, you did a dot cache friends next. And I have never seen that before, and I just want to ask more about that. What, what's happening right there? You're saying any error that's so the throw up earlier is going to hit that dot cache at the bottom. Yep. And you're going to call next. I'm just not familiar with that syntax, I guess. So next is the function in Express that can either progress from one middleware to the next or can handle an error. So in Express, if you call next with nothing, then it will progress to the next middleware handler in the stack. Is that clear? Like you're saying calling, like invoking it with, like you say next parent open close. Yeah, so let me, let me go back over here real quick. Now let's, uh, let's call this JS so that it. Uh, oh, if I say spell it out, it's probably not. So you've got your app dot use and then some sort of thingy. You know, let's say this is your logger. Reg, res, next. Forgive the. Uh, Quick typing console.log rec dot URL. Okay, so this is your logger, and then you got app.use function, some other thing, and yeah, it goes off. Okay, so when you call next, with you invoke it, you call it, you run it. However you want to say it, invoke and call are both beautiful terms to use. It's it's going to do whatever it does, and it's going to then pass to the next middleware rather than stopping. If you don't call next, then you need to call res.send or JSON or whatever. So that's clear, yeah? Yeah. Okay. But if there were an error, you know, so um, I, this is stupid because this could never happen. But let's say, you know, this is what's gonna happen is, if there's a rec.url, we're gonna log the URL. Um, you know, you're gonna be done. Now, if not, well, here's an error. There are ghosts in the machine. I was with you in that way, but I was missing return right after next. Well, well yeah, because I'm gonna re I'm gonna return because I don't want it to continue to go. So so if if the happy path so I mean, we could we could we could just you know equally well we could turn it around, oops, which is normally what I like to do, but in this case they're equal. Um, you know, we could we'd say, okay, put the happy path down here, put the error path here. Oops. Now you'll see a lot of people doing this, which I think is really confusing. Return next, that doesn't make any sense because next doesn't return anything. So I don't ever do that because it, it, it's not readable. Because if I do not know the API, if I've not gone and inspected the next function, I might think, oh, they're returning some special value of next into Express for Express to handle in some special way. No, that's not the case. Next, 100% of the time, returns undefined. Always, every time, never returns anything. So the idea of saying return next is just bonkers to me because there's nothing to return. There never would be anything to return. Why would you confuse someone and make it look as though you're trying to return something? But then, you know, when you do the opposite, people are so used to seeing return next. But sometimes when you do next return, they're like, wait, what's that? It's like, well, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so I don't wanna... But anyway, so is this clear? Yes. So then uh, the thing that might not be clear to you from this is what does catch take? It takes a function that receives one argument, which is error. Next is a function that receives one argument, which is error. So. Well, it receives up to four, right? No, next only receives one. 
It receives zero or one. Well, actually, I don't know. Maybe there is a case where it receives four. No, but you're probably right. I'm, I'm confused. So I just, I just thought, you know, it's the error drag and grows next. No, no, no. That's the handler. So this is the handler up here. So here we have middleware, right? And if we go to the error middleware right here, error recres next. But when I call next and it has an error, that's a signal to express that it should skip, it should skip all other routes. It's not gonna try any other routes. It's gonna go straight to the first matching error handler. And then that error handler can call next again with the error or without the error. It can actually do either one. If it calls it with the error, it will go straight to the next error handler. If it calls it without the error because the error has been handled somehow, which I don't know if a practical use case for that, but I'm sure one exists that's actually reasonable, then it would continue to go through the next set of routes. It's just like, you're saying next error, an error it can just be an object, though. So if if you're writing bad code, yes. Like it is possible to write bad code in which an error is an object that is not an error object. So anywhere in any code where you see something called E or ERR, um, with with pretty much zero exception, you should be able to do, let me go here. Uh, I don't know if I can make this bigger like I want to. There we go. So I could do var x equals something that has message, yo, code, eo, right? I can do this. If I do x instance of instance of error, I'm going to get false. What I should be doing is new error and then pass it in a message. And then do x.code equals eo. Whoa, no. Here. And then if I do x instance of error, it will be true. If you ever do an instance of an ERR and it returns false, that is a bug. Because even if you subclass, so you can do, um, oh gosh, I forget. I, I don't use a lot of the features of JavaScript because they're super fluid. JavaScript is one of the languages where there's too many hands in the pot and everybody's like, oh, I want to be able to do this way. I want to be able to do this way. I want to be able to do it this way. So there's a million ways to do everything. None of them are any different, and most of them are worse. You know, like they don't. Anyway, so there is a case that I do understand for subclassing an error. So basically, you can have something like this. Say x's instance of type error might be false, but x's instance of error would be true, and then um, type error is instance of error would be true, except I need to do new type error. So if I did new type error of foo, and I'd say instance of error is true. So even if you subclass an error, it will still be of the superclass error. But I don't recommend that you do this. There is a strong case for it. I, I understand why someone would do it. I understand why somebody would argue for it, because like I said before, I'm just duct typing my errors. If an error has a dot status, I'm assuming that it's one of my errors yeah. that I created. If I wanted to be sure, then I could create my own error type. And instead of uh, checking error .status, duct type style, I could do uh, error instance of AJ error. And then I would be guaranteed certainly that if it's an, because even if somebody else created a subclass of error that was called AJ error. Let's say that AJ was the most popular name in the world. And so everybody called their error AJ error. Every single instance of AJ error or every, not instance, every single subclass of error that's called AJ error would be in its own namespace or its own, not its own namespace, its own scope. 
So if I had a function over here and a function over here and a function over here, and each one returned their own AJ error that was an AJ error that was in their module, when I check instance of AJ error against my AJ error, it would return false for all of them except for mine. So this is a way that I could 100% guarantee with absolute certainty if the type matches, I know it's one of my errors. But I see JavaScript as more of a scripting language as it was originally developed because I'm old school. I come from you know, 2010 where that's what JavaScript was. It was a scripting language. And I don't see the benefit of all of these classical and object-oriented features that they add on top of it. And even the people that tout it one year turn around and turn away from it the next. So greatest example being React. React did all this stuff. You know, they pushed to get all this stuff into the standard, you know, got released in all the browsers. And as soon as people actually started using them, they're like, wait a minute. Classes are a bad idea in JavaScript. This just makes coding hard and stupid. Actually, React hooks. Let's get rid of classes. It was a bad idea. Apologize. But it's stuck in the language and we can't get rid of it from the language. And so there's a lot of things like that where, yes, there is a case for it. Yes, it can be really useful. And if you do find a use for it, maybe I wouldn't argue against you, although I probably would. But I prefer to err on the side of simplicity. And if something is a 90, I mean, unless there was, I, I don't know. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too much because I'm just babbling. But there's, there's a possible case for where doing it this way would be totally accurate. But I just prefer to keep it simple. And duct typing works 99.9% .9 of the time. Totally. And I want to see if anyone has to go, to go back to where we were. If I can. <laughs> Um, basically, I never knew this before, but so the error handling and built into Express is actually doing this instance of checking on that first parameter. It's not doing an instance of check. I'm just telling you that if you did that instance of check and it failed, you should file a bug with the maintainer of the library that caused it to fail. Right. I guess I'm just still wondering, we don't have to talk about this, we can move on, but I'm just still wondering how I have Handle errors is the last one in the chain intuitively knows when somebody calls next with one parameter, I know that's an error. Well, it knows it because there's one parameter. So there's two options. There's either one parameter or there's no parameters. If there's no parameters, then it's going, goes to the next thing in the chain that's middleware. If there's one parameter, that parameter is an error. Now, what I would have preferred, and I think a lot of people would have preferred because this is such a widely used library is that, and maybe it does, I haven't actually checked to see, but if you were to call next with something that wasn't an error, I think that it should indeed throw an exception and say, you passed something that's not an error where an error was expected. But again, this actually goes against the traditional way of JavaScript because traditionally JavaScript is not typed. Nowadays, JavaScript is liquid typed. I don't know what to call it. It's not a type system in the way that most languages have type systems. It's kind of similar. It's becoming more similar to Python in a way. So it, Python has strict dynamic typing, which sounds like they're juxtaposed, and I guess they kind of are, because we think of static, strict static typing or loose dynamic typing, but Python is actually strictly dynamically typed. And some things in JavaScript are strictly dynamically typed, like big ints, and most things in JavaScript are loosely dynamically typed, like strings and numbers. And then let me, let me finish one other thing here, because I wanted to make sure this was clear. Um, so if I had something that could, I'm just going to make another space down here, way down here. So these two things are equivalent. So we've got to do stuff that returns a promise. It's going to do some stuff. Also, I never use the arrow syntax for functions because I don't ever have the problem that arrow syntaxes were designed to solve because I don't use classes. And since I don't use classes, I don't use arrow syntaxes. And the word function is easy for my brain to understand. Whereas parentheses and equals and arrows are difficult for my brain to understand. <laughs> even when you have like a one-line function, you do it. 
I, even when I have a one line function, I won't do it because it's just, well, I, I have a reference. It is. I think it's just whatever you like. I just, I just don't think it should be there. I, I, because it just adds one, there are so many things in JavaScript, like let, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm using let now, but sometimes I regret it and I think I just ought to go back to var. Var is very simple. The rules of var are extremely simple. It only really has, it has one rule and one exception. When you declare a var, the var is declared to the scope of the function. Full stop, period. That is the rule. That's it. The one exception is if there is a try catch and the catch executes, the var is scoped to the try. Which, so if the try executes and completes successfully, then the var is scoped to the function. But if the catch executes, then the var is kept to the try, scoped to the try, not the function. That is a weird, weird thing. And I've also had cases where a try catch doesn't actually unroll values. And so stuff that executed in the try is effective in the catch, but in a compiled language, if you put a try catch, the stack will unroll so that whatever the initial value of, of a variable was before the try executed in the catch, you'll have that exact same value. But because of the asynchronous nature of JavaScript and all that other stuff, you can get executions inside of a try that after a catch is executed are still modified, which is basically violates the premise of what a try catch is entirely. <laughs> I can't remember the rule, but isn't it like var can hoist, but let can't? Or am I, am I confusing that with something else? I don't know if let can hoist, but let can. I don't think it can. Let has something called the temporal dead zone. So it, I think what happens is that it syntactically is valid to use a let before it's declared, but it is a runtime error. Yeah, that's a different rabbit hole. Yeah. Anyway, what I was gonna show is this. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. Then does this make sense? Okay, that's the thing that I meant to get to 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time. Yeah. Can you go back to the very first ideal slide? Yes. So you can let that sink in. <laughs> like what's possible? Yeah, and every single slide is the same scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just different ways of using. But the, the key thing is, using a weight and a catch. And it would have async at the top. For the yes, 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 that is a, that is an errata. I will, maybe. so this will go, let me show you where this will go so that you can get it, get to it later if you would like to. So I'm going to put this beside the readme and it's gonna be called slides.md. Okay. So, if uh, uh, when I upload this to YouTube for people that have watched through all of the banter, that's where the slides are going to be. It's going to be right there. The slides are in Markdown. So am I missing something, or is do should we pass rest to do stuff to reply to the HTTP request? Okay, so I did mention this earlier, and this is why I say I'm on the fence about it because of the question you were just asking, because it's not intuitively obvious to the casual observer what's happening here. With async router, if you return a value, since it's async, it's returning a promise. So it's promising a value. It, if it receives a value, it will call res.json on the value. So I'll, I'll go open up this code. Um, so we can look at it together. So here it is, and it's 110 lines of glory. 
this is the bit right here. Response equals await function dot apply arguments. So fn is equivalent to your handler. So function recres next. That's what this is. This is this function right here is this function right here. So it's going to call it, well, it's going to use apply so that the arguments get spread and it's going to await the result. If headers have already been sent, meaning you called res.json yourself, it's done. If there is a response and you did not send the headers, then it will call res.send. Otherwise, it's going to expect that a middleware should call next. Now, the reason for that being is that if I await the function, then I do not know whether the function was asynchronous or synchronous. All I know is whether or not I got a value. Now I could change this so that I call the function, call this P for promise, check to see if there is a promise, and if there is a promise, await the promise. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna change this right now. I'm gonna put this as a proposed patch to this, which I don't think would break anything that exists, but might do better. Um, well, no, it could break something that exists, but it would be not ideal. Probably would not be any code that exists in the world as of yet. So what I could do is I could call this P. So first of all, I don't even need to, oh, no, I didn't need to do that, okay. So the function has to run, and then I could check if p and not then, no, then I could do, oh gosh, this is the other problem with let, then you have to go declare everything up, well, I guess it's not a problem because that's what I do anyway. Um, but let's see. Response. I hate const. I don't ever use const. Const is only in here because this is a fork. Because const is the opposite of readable. Because const, if you sound it out, it sounds like constant. So you would expect that anything that's a const would behave as a constant, but it's not. It's some sort of special bespoke JavaScriptism that doesn't exist in any other type of language and is not a constant as you would expect it to be. Yeah, it, it's weird. Okay, so I could do this. I'm actually not going to pull request this because I think that the way that it is is better. Um, but I, I, I could do something like this and that way I could ascertain was this handled synchronously or asynchronously by first checking to see if it's a promise and then awaiting it. And if I didn't have to await it, then I'd know that it's synchronous. And then if it's undefined, I know to, it's, I can hold that in my head, but it's difficult to explain it. And I, I don't like the idea of it. So I'm just gonna hit refresh here. Are you sure you want to send the form again? No, I don't know. Okay. It says send the form again. I don't think I'm actually sending anything. I'm just re reloading. Okay. So what I will do though, is if undefined is equal equal type of not equal. That I will propose as a patch. Um, let's see. All 
falsy. Falsy? How do you spell falsy? That's, That's just a not actually a word. Okay. It's a computer science term. Yes. I think that was number There's two. There's no wrong way to spell it. But it could become a word. There we go. Okay, so I will consider uh, merging in this change, which would solve one of the problems that we talked about. I think that that is a safe change to make that would not cause any undesired behavior and would make it so that if you returned null or false, that it would return as expected. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, um, anybody online got any more questions? All right, well, then I say we adjourn. Back to pizza. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You are welcome. I am glad to hear it. <laughs>